Welcome to our committee meeting tonight. We have a number of items on the agenda. <coughs> Excuse me, I'd like to welcome members of the audience. We have, we're now on YouTube live, so we welcome our, our audience watching on uh, YouTube, and we welcome Colin McLean from the Journal Pioneer. And we have our city staff here with us tonight. We have our new CEO, Rob Philpott, and our director, acting director of finance, Kristen, is around the corner there. And we got uh, Greg Goody, our electrical engineer. And we have Aaron, our tech services director. And JP DeRoge is here someplace. He's over here, director of community services and staff from uh, tech services. We have Thane Jenkins. And at this time, Thane, we pass on condolences. We know you lost your mother in the last few days. So we pass on our condolences to you and your family. And Linda Stevenson, uh, welcome. And uh, Councillor Ramsey is unable to be with us tonight. So I uh, heard there'll be no uh, police committee meeting tonight. Uh, and uh, I, that's all I have at this point. Everybody knows all of the councillors. We don't have to introduce them, I don't think. Everybody got their name tagged. And at this time, I'll turn it over to the chair of the planning board, uh, Councillor Brian McFeely, and your committee. The floor is yours, sir. I thank you, Your Worship, and uh, welcome folks to the uh, February 4th meeting of planning board. Uh, just a little bit of a preface before we get into the meeting. Uh, uh, the planning board members are uh, uh, <coughs> Councillor Carey and, and Basil. Uh, the mayor and Barb Ramsey who's missing tonight. So they would be the voting members of, of uh, planning board. Other councillors certainly welcome, we welcome questions. Uh, the public meeting was held a couple of weeks ago and uh, that was the opportunity for uh, public input into the process uh, and uh, you know un unless there's new information to put on the table council has has received that uh, that public input so our subject tonight is to talk about uh, two nine uh, rezoning uh, amendment and discretionary use uh, application for 291 dash 295 McEwen Road. The supporting explanation, the purpose, the purpose of the zoning amendment is to allow town housing, maximum of eight units per building. The applicant is proposing a six unit townhouse. Townhouse means a building that is divided into three or more vertically adjacent joined dwelling units, separated by a vertical wall with each unit being constructed directly on grade. Townhouses require individual public utilities and street frontage for each unit and can be further subdivided as per uh, section 8.15. Background, an application was received from Kitchton Ms. Liu for PID number 1060888 and PID number 1060870 to amend the city zoning bylaw zoning from low density mixed residential R2 <laughs> to medium des density residential R3 zone. A public meeting was held January 21st, 2020 and council gave first reading on that same date. The report, under section 5.7 the zoning bylaw and planning board and the tech services committee reviews a zoning bylaw amendment, it has to consider the following general criteria as applicable. A, conformity with all requirements of this bylaw. Staff comment, if council approves the zoning map amendment from R2 to R3, the applicant will, will be permitted to construct a townhouse subject to a discretionary use approval and the development standards of the proposed R3 zone. The discretionary use approval runs simultaneously to the rezoning application as the public notice process is the same for both the discretionary use and the rezoning. The well, discretionary use being requested is for a six unit townhouse on the subject property. B, conformity with the official plan. Staff comments, rezoning conforms to the official plan section 5.1.1, residential zones. Uh, in that particular section, it's uh, the, obje obje the objective is to promote all housing types in the city. The policy statements, uh, one, to promote a sufficient diversity of housing types, residential densities and 10 year options to meet varied segments of market demand. And two, require that all housing be connected to community water and sewer services, except that where it is impractical to make connection in an agricultural zone. 
on site servicing may be utilized in compliance with minimum lot size requirements under the PEI Planning Act regulations. C. Suitability of the site for the proposed development. Staff comment. This site is suitable for a medium density residential use land. A public street and municipal services are available. The side yard distance from building the property line required in the current R2 zone is 2 meters, 6.5 feet. The required side yard in the proposed R3 zone is 3 meters, 9.8 feet. The R3 development standards are as follows. Uh, the R3 zone, the, the chart is up on the wall there. I don't think I need to read that chart into the record. It's, it's there, Your Worship. Yeah, that's fine. Shows the, uh, the lot areas, the lot depth, the frontage, and the uh, front yard, side yard uh, distances, the rear yard, and the maximum heights there. Uh, the property now owned by the Martins was granted a side yard variance of 6 point or 6.25% uh, in April of 2007. D, compatibility of the proposed development with surrounding land uses, including both existing and projected uses. Staff comment, the abutting property to the west is zoned institutional, Three Oaks High School. The abutting property to the north and south are zoned R2. One property on the east is zoned R2, while the other property on the east is designated as a restricted use for a parking lot. There are R3, R4, and C3 properties located nearby. The proposed six-unit townhouse is being proposed as a single story in efforts to blend with the existing single-level homes along McEwen Road. Any other discretionary uses in the R3 zone would require a separate application, i.e. a tourist establishment or uh, such as an inn, and in turn, uh, a, a separate uh, public access. And there's the, uh, the map showing the, uh, the proposed uh, development on the Cuban Road. So E, any comments from residents other than the interested persons? A public meeting was held on uh, January 21st, 2020. The public meeting notice was advertised in the January 9th edition of the Journal Pioneer. 16 letters were mailed to 12 property owners. Fred Martin, 299 McEwen Road, spoke. He had concerns regarding the survey pit in the northwest corner of the lot, 295 McEwen Road, and drainage of the property in the area around the subject properties. Giselle Martin, 299 McEwen Road, questioned whether or not council can make a zoning decision if the site plan is preliminary without measurements. She also had questions regarding some of the R3 uses and the uh, size of the proposed six-unit townhouse. Kajitim Muslin uh, indicated that he will not build any closer to the property line than what is allowed in the proposed R3 zone. Giselle Martin asked what the setback was for this development. The concerns raised by Fred and Giselle, Mar uh, Giselle Martin are addressed in, the, in this report. F, adequacy of existing water, sewer, roads, storm water, and electrical services, city parking and parkland for accommodating the development and any projected infrastructure requirements. Staff comment, a 300 millimeter diameter water main on McEwen Road is capable of accommodating the water uses for the change in zoning from R2 to R3. The city's water supply is also capable of the added load of the additional units. Two units. The two uh, 200 millimeter diameter sewer mains on McEwen Road are capable of accommodating the sewage load from the changing zoning from R3 to R, to R from R2 to R3. Excuse me. The city stewards sewage collection and the treatment system are capable of processing the added load of the two additional units. McEwen Road is a collector street and will be able to handle the traffic from the individual townhouse units. The existing lots have access to the city's stormwater system on McEwen Road with an existing stormwater structure uh, at the property line. The development will require a stormwater plan to accommodate the area's natural drainage to be directed to this structure from the surrounding area. Electrical services can be provided to each unit. G, impact from the development on, on pedestrian vehicular access and safety and on public safety generally. Staff comment, the development will have three possible access points across the existing concrete sidewalk 
which the development will have to provide changes for existing curb and sidewalk at the development's cost. McEwen Road is at Collector Street, which has been designated to handle the traffic. The additional six vehicles or less from this development would have minimal effect. The development will meet the minimum setbacks for vehicle access from the nearest intersection of McEachern Street and McEwen Road. H, compatibility of the uh, development with environmental, scenic, and heritage resources. Staff comment, no negative impact. Uh, I, impact on city finances and budget. Staff comment, not applicable. J, other matters as specified by this bylaw. And there's nothing applicable there. K, other matters as considered relevant. Staff comment, when processing a discretionary use application, Council can determine the number of units allowed. The applicant is proposing six units. The R3 standards determine the allowed size and placement of the building. The proposed lot is 198 feet by 102 feet. Both, that's both lots combined. The allowable buildable area of the proposed lots is 178 feet by 65.5 feet. So the recommendation from technical service staff that the application from Kujim Ms. Louie uh, for PID number 1060888 and PID number 1060870 to amend the city zoning bylaw from low density mixed residential R2 to medium density residential R3 zone be recommended to be approved by council and that the application for discretionary use for six unit townhouse be recommended to be approved by council. Um, as per section 5.10, subsection B, subsection three of the zoning bylaw, the planning board shall make a recommendation to council on this application before it is approved or, or denied. The planning board recommendation, whether carried or defeated, will be brought forward for council for a final decision. Uh, so with that, before we get into the motion, uh, perhaps uh, see if staff have any additional information or, Bruce? I, I just had one question, and I think we asked it the other night. Uh, there was two lots, and maybe you addressed it in here. Uh, th there's two lots and we're doing six units. Six units? Yes. Over the two lots? Yes. Is, do those lots have to be into one lot? Um, can you? Technically, they can divide it further into six individual. Like, you know, they, right now we're looking at just rezoning two properties to allow it to happen. For them to develop yeah. then, they may choose to have firewalls and have each individual unit yeah. they're so all going can to you, can you take the firewall right up to the, the yeah. property line y yes in and that and zone and that's what they'll have like uh they could have six units and they could divide it up into six individual right individual properties if they want to have individual ownership each that's why each unit is going to have their own services as well from the street water and sewer okay i just i thought there was a uh, you had to have a setback. But not in, in the row housing because they're going to be attached. There is okay. going to be a setback on the end okay. units, yeah. like the I, last. I'm not against it or yep. anything like that. I just wanted to make sure that that was, yep. we don't run into a, a roadblock here. Because if someone builds a semi now, like he wants to build a semi now, yeah. he can divide the semi. He will put a block wall in, and he'll divide the existing two lots into right. four, four, and he'll divide them right at a zero lot line on the block wall. Okay. on the interior walls and follow yeah. that. Okay, thank you. Any other? Councillor Stone? Councillor Campbell. Uh, I think there was, there was, when the Martins were here the other night, they were just wanting more to, uh, to have it recorded as they are concerned about the, the drainage. But the other one was uh, preliminary plans. They would be more comfortable if they were more complex than the ones that were passed into them. And the, 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 the applicant said, we want to make sure that we can get approval. Here's generally what I plan to do. Gave a, a basic floor plan area, then gave a couple of elevation or 
front uh, view shots from a, a couple of comparable ones to say this is what I'd like to like to build as well. And if he gets his rezoning, he says that I'm prepared to spend my money to get my concept stuff to come in. He'll we will need those before he gets his permits to to do it. But he has stated he's going to do a one story, and it'd be similar to what he has. <coughs> Um, no, we're really just into that. Right now, that's the type he's going to do. All information will be available after a permit is issued. You know, when, when a permit is, when they finally decide to proceed to price it up and see that everything's viable and, and, uh, and issue a permit. Councillor Snow? Uh, just regarding the stormwater plan, uh, so if this gets approved, it goes ahead. Uh, from that, there will be a plan on how yeah. the stormwater will be properly directed so it's not affecting any of the neighboring yeah. properties? We'll, we'll probably give you a quick recap here now. And previous to the previous to the street being built behind them, stormwater used to, there's a field, uh, if I go in directions, there's a field east of Balcom. The water drains towards Balcom. It drains through culverts and pipe system under Balcom and it used to dump into the fields behind these houses in front of McEwen. Whenever that subdivision was built, behind these houses. That storm system was captured, so all the water from that field, all the water from Balcom is captured in a pipe system. The new street had to put in a pipe system, and it's piped out to McEwen Road. Excuse me, Aaron, that's the map that's up now, so yeah. people want to reference So that. what's, uh, right now there's a, there's a couple of, as Linda's pointing there, there's a couple of structures, that's McEwen Road. Yeah. There are, that was already there for years. It, goes on an angle and it used to pipe to the back of the first houses of McEwen and it used to just be a structure of the field that used to collect it. Whatever, so that was a lot of the storm system would collect it run through the field. What didn't collect there would run down towards the current empty lots or towards McEwen Road and spill over the curb. When the street behind got developed, that pipe got extended and connected to the new street. So all water that runs out of the street is collected in that system. That street was also connected to the system up on Balcom Drive. I, so I guess the reason the reason yeah. for my question is yeah. uh, some of the staff in the city know and his worship knows that in my ward we've had uh, development that it was just a lot basically that was raised and then yeah. now the water is going on to a neighboring property and there's some concerns from the neighbor on whether or not the proper drainage is there and we're so we, we've really been struggling with that and I think as we went out and seen them we found some maybe I don't know if there's some issues maybe with the way it was done or I, I don't know but yeah. I just you, you hate to see you, you, we don't want to hold back development but when we're doing development yeah. we've got to make sure that it's not affecting any of the neighboring properties because that's where we get into crowds of people saying you know what we don't want to see anything done because when it's yeah. done it's not done for properly, it, so. it, when new subdivisions in the last 15 years when new subdivisions were built one of the requirements is there to bring in a stormwater management plan so when the street got developed behind it, what you see on the screen is how they intend for all the houses to have their drainage. Copies of that are given to every developer for every lot to say this is the overall plan that was approved. If they're on lot 27, a copy of lot 27 is given to the developer and saying that's how you would grade your lot. There still is a, at the small arrow sh on the plan, show the direct, the front half of the lots are gonna drain out to the street. The back half of the lots are gonna drain to the backyards. Two or three of them are going to run along until they get into the existing structure that was there. Now, when uh, the lots on McEwen Road were done, there wasn't a, drain, a, a grading plan done, but there is a catch basin structure in front of these <coughs> two lots. Yeah. They'll have to come in whenever they go to say, here's where we want to build our four or six units, wherever they, many they end up finally building. And we'll have to allow, get them to show us, here's the intended plan of bringing the stormwater drainage from your lots out to McEwen Road. So any property done in the last 15 years should have that stormwater drainage plan attached New to it. When major subdivisions are done, that's one of the steps they have to do. And then we make copies of it for all the individual lots so that individual builders know that's what they're supposed to build to. Okay, thank you. Councillor McComas, uh, Deputy Mayor McComas. Thank uh, I thank Director Aaron. I might be repeating some of the information okay. that you've explained, but yeah. I just want to be really clear. Yeah. Um, at the last meeting, Mr. and Mrs. Martin talked about the, the drainage, the water drainage that flows from, I believe there's a swale. Yeah. Uh, and in Section F, it, it does mention, and I do think you've just explained it, but I, uh, about the city sewage collection, but further down in that section, it speaks to the city storm water system on McEwen Road with an existing stormwater structure at the property line. So is that th what you're specifically speaking of? 
yes but there also was existing stuff behind and further up the subdivision that was to handle it and now it'll not be a hundred percent until all the subdivision behind them is, is developed but right now anything from half the subdivision is no longer going towards the back of the house of McEwen Road it's being captured by the street that new street that went in whenever individual houses get built on the, that, that back on of these houses of McEwen the front half of those lots will still be graded out to the street so technically only half of the lots, the rear portion of the lots will drain to the backyards, which which in common ground with the McEwen Road lots. So, so I guess my, my part B then would be, so with those matters or with those structures in place, would that alleviate any of the concerns that the, the uh, it, it, neighbors it, would have? It is, but we're still dealing with winter and snow. Sure, and, and build get, up. When you get snow that backs in your backyard and starts to melt, but generally, the yards are to be graded away from the house so that, but there's still gonna be snow in the, everybody's backyard in come melt time. But okay. before, you had acres of land that was draining towards it. There was a big wide open field that was draining. Now, at least the underlying ground is that they're sloping and there's gonna be another storm system halfway in there. Okay, thank you. So, Aaron, would, in your opinion, would it be any more or less drainage than there was if there was two duplexes on those two lots as opposed to the six units? Uh, yeah, right now everything we've been talking about has been dealing with not this individual development. No. It's all been dealing with the l acreage of land that's behind them. No. And that's what all this other, we're trying to show you that there was a drainage system involved for all the property behind. It doesn't affect how this, this gets, they're gonna have to redirect his drainage around his buildings to get either over it doesn't have to go to the structure that's in front of his property they just happen to have one left there typically it would just go over the curbs onto the storm system yeah, exactly. and run down the street exactly. so he can either get it over the curbs to this that'll run down the street and get into the street system there just happens to be a structure between these two lots that he can use to drain his front yards as well yeah thank you any other questions or clarification required If not, uh, planning board, the recommendation, the, uh, this application bears the recommendation of planning board. So we would need a mover and a seconder from planning board. Moved by Councillor Adams, seconded by Your Worship Mayor Stewart, that the application bear the recommendation of planning board. Uh, all those in favor? Uh, Contramine? Motion carried. So this, this goes to the monthly and meeting. And this will go to the, the recommendation will go to the monthly meeting on Jan uh, February 18th? Tuesday. Tuesday, February 18th. This year because of the holiday. Yeah. And that's at 6.30. It's open to the public and be right here in the chamber. So and with that, Your Worship, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Councillor McFeely. And at this time, I'd like to welcome CBC, Mr. Higgins. Welcome to the city of Summerside. And... Uh, so we'll uh, continue on with the agenda. I believe we have a presentation to be made coming up in the next item. Uh, we'll turn it over to Councillor Kerry Adams and uh, the presentation regarding the museum. And just before they, they start, uh, I think this council unanimously supports a museum of some kind. We've got to get going here, whether it's for the military and there's lots of history for our sports and our fire department and many other things. So. Uh, we look forward to the presentation, and uh, we will turn it over this time to Councillor Adams for le legal affairs and culture. I believe the presentation comes under your leg, so. I don't think your button is pushed there, is it? There you go. Here we go. Sorry. Good for something as important okay. as this. Um, so I guess what we'll do, I believe Barb, yeah, Barb's here. So Barb, if you want to come on up, we can move right into your presentation. <coughs> Excuse me. No, I'm good. Good evening, Mayor Stewart, Council. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to present my presentation to you this evening. Beautiful heritage homes are a prominent feature of the city of Summerside and are the delight of residents and tourists alike. 
Heritage and culture are very important to this city, as it is shown by the McNaught Archives and History Center, Wyatt Heritage Properties, Eptec Center, College of Piping, Harborview Theater, Summerside Armories, and by such association as the Summerside and Aerial Historical Society, the Royal Canadian Legion, and the Lest We Forget Committee. The Lest We Forget Committee of Summerside, of which I am chairperson, honors the men and women who fought in wars so that we could have freedom. Over the last 20 years or so, Gerard Gallant has completed over 150 display boards, many of which were displayed during Veterans Week in November. As chairperson of this committee, I would like to work with council to have a museum in Summerside to be able to properly maintain and display these precious boards and military artifacts, as well as other heritage material, which may be stored away in attics or in danger of being discarded or sold. A museum would preserve this heritage for our citizens and those of the future to see and for our veterans' families to share with the public. I am very passionate about keeping our veterans' memories alive. So please, let's work together to make this happen. If we do, do see that our heritage is being properly preserved for our future generations, precious history will become a thing of the past. And my recommendation would be the armories. Thank you for your time. Appreciate that. Um, well, we're gonna, so anybody have anything? Any questions? Any questions, any questions for, for Barb? Yeah. Go ahead. Um, I, I don't really have a question. I just uh, make a quick comment. Uh, thanks, Barb, for uh, coming. I. Uh, I often uh, have coffee in the morning with Barb or at lunch, whatever time, uh, that I happen to be at the cafe. And uh, I also get to talk to George quite a bit as I see him around. And, and there's a number of people within the community that are very passionate about uh, the culture and the history we have in Summerside. And uh, it, this is, a, is something that obviously means a lot to a lot of people, and rightfully so. So thank you to you and everybody else who uh, puts their time and effort into uh, keeping these mementos and, and uh, having them for future generations to see, I think it is very important. So uh, just thank you for the effort of coming today. And, and uh, as His Worship said, I, I think Council is definitely uh, looking at a number of possibilities uh, for such a thing. So so thank, thank you for your time and that's it. Thank you, Councillor Snell. Thank you. I guess uh, just similar to Councillor Snow, just thank you for, for advocating for this initiative and uh, for, for all the folks that came. And I know it's kind of kind of close to my heart because I know I gave George some of my some of my father's stuff to put into the collection. And uh, uh, it really is a shame that we don't have a place that we can uh, that we can show this collection to uh, other generations coming along and, and so forth. So. Uh, uh, again, thank you for your your uh, your initiative, Mayor Stewart. May I make a couple of comments? Sure, the chair is Councillor Adams. Sure, sure, if you wanted to just um, say your name yes. and your address for the record. Dean Shaw Kensington, former resident of Summerside, voted for one of the councillors here some time ago. My concern is very simple. Someone says a little bit earlier that the museum of some sort. Let's use an example of the province of PEI. Unfortunately, they've been playing around for decades and decades and decades about a provincial museum. I would hate like the devil to see this military museum remain something that we're going to deal with in the future, deal with in the future, deal with in the future. If you do any research, the greatest product that we've ever exported is not agricultural, it's not fisheries, it's people. We have people all across the world from PEI that have had family members fight in various wars going back to the Boer War when Taylor and Riggs, who have a statue in Charlottetown, 
and onward and onward and onward. I have uncles that fought in World War I, World War II, and so on. And I have many relatives that want to come home and consider what contribution that their family made during the wars. And I think it's, to put a fine tune to it, it's also a major tourism attraction in its own right. If you follow ancestry across the world, people are becoming more and more and more interested in what their family did. They're, de they're attempting to f define their own family, they're attempting to find their own history within the family, and therefore there's a great deal of research that's being done through ancestry, and discoveries are being made every day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Shaw. Is there anybody else that would? I just make a comment. I do, I do not see any other lights on there, but uh, thank you for that presentation, Mr. Shaw. And uh, you mentioned so many in their graves. Uh, I personally have an uncle in his grave over in Italy, killed, I believe, 75 approximately years ago. So everybody in here in these chambers understand fully that we have to get something in place here. Uh, this council will work on it, and uh, besides the military museum, you probably heard us talking about other beautiful artifacts we have in the fire department and sports department, and uh, but the, the military, we've been a military town for years. So this council is working on that and, uh, and uh, support this 100%. It's going to take a little while to get something together, but uh, I'm, I can go out on the limb and say everybody in here agrees that we got to get something in place and uh, and uh, that's the plan. Councillor, sorry, I guess Councillor Coleman, was I jumping ahead here? Sorry. Oh, okay. Did you want to go ahead? You can just state your name and address for sure. the record. I'm Marlene Goody and I'm a veteran and I live in Muskush now but I own property here in mm -hmm. Summerside and my husband is a local I want to put a face to a name and say that this museum is not just about showing artifacts, but it could also be an opportunity for veterans to meet. Because right now, there's between 40 and 60 veterans that pay to use a local community center because we have no opportunities or places that we could go to. We appreciate what our legions are doing for us, we do, but we also battle addictions. So a lot of people don't want to meet because of the alcoholism, and because of the BTL machines. So it would give us an opportunity to meet and have kind of like a safe haven for us because this is the largest geographical boundary with where our, vis our veterans actually retire to. It is the best spot for us. We have things that are on the go here that, that we don't have throughout the rest of the nation, and uh, we'd like to have that grow because we're seeing more and more people. We had seven people that were homeless at one point in time in and across our island. <coughs> and although I'm not a native and I moved here to when I retired from the military, it was chosen because of the community and the way that you have embraced us. And we appreciate that. So if you could just find a little spot for us to not just show our artifacts, but a place where we could meet regularly and talk and have that opportunity to share with the community some of the programs that we're uh, incorporating right now, it would be muchly appreciated. Thank you very much. Is there another Councilor could Campbell? I, could I thank you as well for that presentation? And uh, I look at it this way. We'll have one chance to, to get a museum, like we had one chance to get a credit union place. And I feel the Council of the day and the people that did it right. And uh, the same with this city hall. We had one chance to do the city hall, and this will last for a hundred and some years, and maybe more, and let's hope it does. So I think we've got a chance here to get a museum, and, and when we do it, I think everybody wants to make sure that it's not just uh, something to fill in. We, it should be a, a first-class facility, and the, the same with this discussion ongoing right now about a fire department. Our fire building is old, needs to be replaced and we'll get one chance to do that and so th we uh, this council will want to do it right whenever 
it starts. And uh, so I just thought I'd throw that in. Mr. Dalton, welcome. Yes, thank you very much for, for entertaining all our veterans here uh, tonight. I, I always look back, as everybody knows, because uh, history is the greatest teacher. I sat in these chairs here with the George Olskin, Daryl Lachlan, Derek Hughes, all these good staunch citizens of Summerside well over 20 years ago. And we asked for a museum. We asked, could we have the armories? Uh, it's easy to say we need a museum, but a museum is a complex thing. And uh, we're in a bit of a bind here right now. We have maybe a potential four, four ideas for honoring veterans all at once. And uh, some of those will be released shortly. It's important, as said here by everybody, that uh, now we need action because I'll say honestly, talking to some of these people like Errol Lachlan, I've had a few veterans on their deathbed, don't give up the fight. And you know we are fighting. And so there have often been uh, obstacles to get there. But I think in, in goodwill, and as Barb said, we all got to work together on this. And we got to have partnerships. And I've been speaking to a lot of people, different organizations, and they feel the time is now. We have to realize also that besides museums, there's other needs in the community. But most importantly, in anywhere I've been, I believe in the vision, rather than just you come and you present and it goes on the shelf. We've had studies here that I don't think the public even saw the studies on heritage. We paid people good money and there was no further, no follow up. But what I'm hearing tonight is that uh, we want to move forward and that is extremely important. And sometimes I felt like asking the question, what do you have against the military? Why was there always obstacles to make these things happen? So I think this has been a good night and I wish everybody a good evening. And I think it's exciting time because people, as you see by the uh, attendance tonight, people are gonna be advocates and we're getting people phoning us. They want this to happen and I trust the city and the new council will make it happen. Thank you. Thanks, George. Thank you, George. Hello, my name is Randy Ross from Wilmot Valley. I address the council and Mayor Stewart. Uh, I'd just like to stress the urgency of the uh, topic that we're on tonight about the museum. And uh, uh, lately, in the last short while, we've lost some of our serious collectors in the Summerside area. And uh, some of the collections have come up for sale and you can't expect people to hang on to things if they're not gonna be done, something done with them or if they don't have an interest. And they've come up for sale online and everything and uh, so we're gradually losing a lot of our heritage. Uh, and uh, Anyway, uh, about two years ago, a woman called me from Toronto. Her husband, her, I'm sorry, her father had taught uh, flight and uh, navigation at Summerside Base during the war. And she was looking for a place to donate his uniforms and some of his pictures and, and different things. And she came all the way from Toronto and brought her granddaughter and her daughter with her. And they gave me all this stuff, the uniforms, and and I was very glad to receive it, and, but I haven't had much chance to display it. And um, so this, this, uh, while these things are available, they, we have to get in contact with them. I have a couple of items in my own collection, and one of them is a certificate installing Bradford LePage as Lieutenant Governor of PEI, and another one is uh, another certificate installing uh, Samuel Prouse as Scott, Lieutenant Governor of PEI. Now these are important documents and uh, they're sitting in, in a vault that I had rented, eh? And so uh, if it was in another, uh, you know, I'm just stressing the urgency because if anything happens to me, 
then uh, I'm afraid there might be a dumpster in the backyard <laughs> and have that stuff go in it, eh? And it would be a, an awful shame. And I have a lot of uh, really important things to, con you know, that I can't contribute everything, but I, I can contribute things that are going to be of historical importance to Summerside and area. And we have a, a, such a wealth of uh, history in this area from shipbuilding, uh, fox industry, to our military uh, uh, contributions. And uh, I know everybody's on side that are here pretty well. I understand that people are on side. It's just that I wanted to stress the urgency of, of uh, making some quick, quick moves. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ross. No, just a, a comment on the importance of displaying. Uh, my father was a veteran. Second World War was overseas. My uncle George was, and I knew that. But my grandfather died when I was 13, and nothing was ever mentioned. And I, I was fortunate enough to see the display that uh, Mr. Chisholm had for Three Oaks High School. And my grandfather, Brandard, was a veteran of both World Wars. So I wouldn't have noticed or would have known and been as proud as I am if that display hadn't have been there because that stuff was never talked about around their home. It was hush, hush, anything to do with the two wars. Anyway, it's certainly important for the display, and thank you. Bruce? Yes, uh, thank you, everybody, uh, Barb, George, Randy, all of you that uh, made the presentations here this evening. It's uh, been something that uh, has been talked about around the table lots of times, but it's really great to see the uh, crowd here tonight that is supporting it. Uh, we, you know, we, we need uh, a few things, but there's, there's probably some of these things that we can do together, and it's great that uh, there seems to be the support uh, here tonight around the table here, but also in our uh, uh, presenters to help see this thing move forward. So uh, again, thank you for the presentation. I also want to echo thank you to Barb Gallant and everybody that's present this evening. Um, I just I want to go back to the, the comments uh, Mr. Dalton had made about um, what have you got against the military? I hope it wasn't towards us because I think many of us sitting in this room do have relatives that are former veterans. Uh, I probably wouldn't be sitting in, in council this evening if it wasn't for decorated uh, war veteran or veteran uh, Mr. George Olscamp who really encouraged me as a young high school student. So I think there is certainly uh, a respect and an honor for our veterans and this community has tried very, very hard to um, keep alive the, the heritage and, and the, the importance and the significance of our veterans. So I think as Mayor Basil and others have echoed, it's something that's very near and dear to our hearts. I also believe what Mayor Stewart did mention is we have one chance to do this right and we have to make sure of the planning, the strategy, how we approach other orders of government uh, to see if we can uh, somehow uh, look for other ways to fund this type of uh, an initiative. So it's not something that we can do easily, but I can assure you everybody in this room is, is very much um, very honored and, and respectful of our military and our veterans. So thank you so much tonight. And uh, we, we certainly are not going to put anything on the shelf. Thanks. Just to put some clarity on my comment, I, and I think it's right that I do that. I am not talking about anybody in this room. I'm talking about a past administration that put roadblocks up to make things happen. So I just want to clarify that. Thank you for that, George. Councillor John? Yeah, uh, just, I don't want to be certainly the only one that doesn't say anything tonight because <laughs> the might be taken as the taken the wrong way. But um, thanks for everybody that got up to, to speak and, and to Barb for, for uh, 
I guess, arranging uh, the presentation. Um, I'm certainly supportive of whatever uh, collaboration comes of, of this tonight. Um, I think um, we, we say it a lot to kind of prove some of the points we make, but um, I think in the eyes of the public, we, we are, at least this this group of us, are the a council that is making change on things and is actually acting on some of those things and not just talking about things and letting the next group of people keep talking about it. Um, and, and I really hope that we're able to, to once again um, put our money where our mouth is, so to speak, and, and, and really get something off the ground because I don't think there's anybody in this room that doesn't have uh, a place in their, their heart or their, their minds or I think everybody here probably has a relative whether they know it or not that uh, that this would that have served in, in some way or another and um, I don't think there's anyone here that would not support something like this but uh, just wanted to to say that I certainly support it as well yeah okay, I just to uh, sum up and uh, I, um, I th we certainly thank everybody for the presentation here tonight and there's no question we s miss the military that we're here for years and everybody in this room including you folks and council we fought tooth and nail to try to keep the base here and uh, but uh, we uh, job wise we ended up with with more jobs out of it but we still miss the military and being a military town for years like we said earlier uh, it's important that we have a, have a museum and I was over in Yarmouth last fall to a, a planning meeting and uh, Yarmouth is a town of half our size, and they have a beautiful museum over there. And, uh, the, 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 and this one was the Provincial Fire M Museum in the town of Yarmouth. And it's, it's beautiful. And even a few years ago, we had our 150-year-old trucks, or whatever they are, they're, they're very old, some of them here in their fire hall. They were stored over there for a number of years, and our past chief went over and got them back here. And they're tucked away in a corner in our old fire hall over there, which is a shame that they're not on display, but hopefully that will happen. And uh, they're, they're beautiful. Uh, and uh, so I think uh, uh, the support is in here to work and, and get this tied together. And like Councillor or er, Deputy Mayor said, it's gonna take a little while, but hopefully the term of this council or before we can get something in place. and. Uh, I certainly thank everybody for the presentation tonight, and uh, and uh, I think there's no doubt the support is here. Back to you, uh, Madam Chair. And just to wrap up, I I couldn't. I looked quickly for it, but I couldn't find it. But there was a quote from Culture Summerside saying how important they also that group of employees thinks this is. So when you have a group of employees like the gang we have in culture um, that are really dedicated to it that means a lot in helping us move it forward too because they have lots of great ideas that they can stuff we'd never think of so um, if I could just sum up with one more thing it slipped my mind there sure. I was uh, <laughs> and maybe you folks heard about it but there's a gentleman in the city he's a collector of grandfather clocks mm -hmm. and I was to his home and saw if you can believe this 300 beautiful clocks hundreds of years old and it's a shame they're in the basement covered up with blankets and he is, uh, you know, he keeps some of them just around where you can see them, but uh, uh, he is a, a, a person who can repair them and so anyway, he would like to donate them to a museum. But So there are so many things that could make a beautiful display here of all uh, the things we talk about, whether it's the military and, and sports and the fire department and whatever. So uh, that's all been taken into consideration as we move forward here. Thank you. That's it for me, for sure. Is it? Yep. Okay. <laughs> and if there's nothing else, we'll adjourn and go into the next community services. Councillor Snow, the Chair of Community Services. Thank you, Your Worship. Thanks, everybody. Uh, I'd like to call the February 4th Community Services Committee to order. Uh, if I could get a Approval of the agenda, moved by Councillor Adam. Uh, we'll call upon uh, Director J.P. DeRogier, and uh, the only item on the agenda tonight is the active transportation. Uh, J.P. has, uh, I guess, an update from our, our last council meeting. 
JP, I'll turn it over to you. <coughs> Thank you, Councillor Snow. <coughs> um, it was uh, Council, sorry, committee's, agent, committee's uh, wishes for us to uh, follow up with uh, the active transportation funding that was announced by the province uh, earlier, or sorry, later in 2019. Um, so staff did so uh, since our last committee meeting. Um, we met with the official uh, active transportation uh, committee that was struck by the province. Uh, this com committee is a, it's a great committee actually it's set forth uh, has representation from transport economic development tourism policy health and wellness etc it's a very well-rounded uh, um, committee that has a strong goal of putting together a, a good island-wide approach to active transportation uh, we did confirm that there's of course the five million dollars allocated in the fund to be spent annually for a five-year period um, of that $5 million, $2 million is actually existing um, transportation and infrastructure renewal funding uh, from the province. $3 million is uh, generated from the uh, license renewal program. Um, but all $5 million will be committed to active transportation initiatives uh, over the next, or $5 million a year over the next five years. Um, we did confirm with the committee, uh, it's not, I shouldn't say it's 100% confirmed, but their plan is right now that municipalities of Summerside and Charlottetown, the large municipalities, will receive $0.50 cent dollars on the funding, uh, primarily because they want to kickstart some of the other projects that are related to, in, sorry, in smaller communities to give sort of a higher percentage. What do you want? Okay. Um, <laughs> the, uh, so yeah, so we're looking at $0.50 cent dollars, uh, for those projects. Um, they're willing to consider as well the enhancement of existing trails that may tie into active transportation um, initiatives in our community. So if we have existing trails that we could add to that link north or south or east or west of our community, they'll certainly consider those. So that's a good piece. Uh, we presented them three or four project concepts uh, that will sort of fit into the committee's current plans and, and they're very supportive of all four of them right now, which is great. Uh, we didn't propose that we would do them all in one year. We proposed that we would break them up over the f four of the five year uh, program. And some of the, some of the you know, four projects we presented may need multiple years per. So we're, we're gonna be getting into that as well. Um, we are, staff are currently putting together these plans and really what we're doing is we're costing them out um, by plan and we're gonna prioritize them during the budget process. But it's nice to know at least going into budget that all four of them have um, endorsement by the committee unofficially, but they were very excited with those projects. Um, and what I can say is that the, the projects are focused from a connectivity component from east to west of the city and from north to south. Uh, and we use the 80, sorry, the 880 mindset, which is, you know, would you allow one of your family members or loved ones who are either eight years old or 80 years old to travel the city, either walking or biking to and from work uh, on their own? Um, and they sort of pass that test in terms of the project. So that's sort of a very quick summary of our meeting with, uh, with the committee. Um, very positive. Um, you know, it's exciting to have the opportunity to, to have 50 cent dollars to go towards active transportation. It's been on our, at least our department's wish list for a number of years now, but to have the ability to leverage some, some dollars towards it is good. And I also think it's a good uh, message from the provincial government that they are focused and, and heavily investing in active transportation uh, over the next five years. So uh, I don't know if you have any questions following that, uh, uh, but. I don't know if council has any questions. Uh, uh, just personally, as chair of community services, obviously active transportation is, a big part of what we would do within the city and and hearing that there's uh, funding available for such uh, projects is promising for sure I'm looking forward to uh, getting closer to what these projects are and, and, and moving hopefully some ahead with some help from the province so uh, if there's any questions from council uh, I notice Councillor Duran has his light on yeah just um so I was listening there I guess my ears kind of perked up both as when you mentioned the, the great funding that may be available and as well, um, when you mentioned, you know, the East, West, North, South, I'd be, um, it's too bad Barb was here, but wasn't here rather, but uh, I know there's a lot of residents out there I'd, that'd probably crucify me if I didn't bring up um, between like Pope and Rotterdam, Greenwood Drive that goes down to, you know, the turf field and the trail and, and uh, a lot of kids from Elm Street travel there and, I don't know if that's any part of any of these uh, projects or plans, but just want to throw that out there. That mm -hmm. That's an area that I know I've been told a lot about, and I know Barb probably has too, being that's yeah. her. Councillor Duran her, has mentioned her it word. several times, yeah. And I may have mentioned it before, but um, just when you said north-south, a little alarm went off, and then you said funding. 
The alarm went off again. There it is. Alarm, alarm. Um, yeah, so what I can say is that uh, um, I, the only reason I'm not presenting the actual concept tonight is just it's slightly premature. I don't have budget numbers. We met last Friday, so I didn't have the opportunity to put costing together and sort of prioritize the list of projects. I think council needs an opportunity to do so during the budget process, but Greenwood Drive is on the list uh, and it's a high priority um, along with Pope Road. Uh, connecting our commercial sector to the downtown as well as on the list um, and and really re enhancing our rails to trails from east to west of the city and those four kind of concepts really tie the whole city together from a north south east to west uh, component um, I think it's important for us to understand that that the rails to trails are a really good piece of infrastructure that run from one end of the city to the other uh, they do cross high traffic areas, but they also cross low traffic areas where you can hop onto lower, or sorry, yeah, lower volume traffic streets and make your way through our city pretty safely. Uh, so we really want to capitalize on the on the rails to trails in addition to some of those other key areas like Pope Road and Greenwood. Um, and like I said, we'll get into more details at the budget process. Uh, Councillor McFeely. Not really a question, more of a comment. Uh, certainly, uh, active transportation was a priority raised at our town hall that, that Councillor Adams and I had back in September, so, and, and that kind of precipitated uh, kind of bringing this forward to to, to committee and, and the money was available too, so the kind of the perfect storm. Perfect. Mm -hmm. um, and I know a couple of years ago you had some maps to show when, you know, the linear trail that would, you know, connect the whole city so that people can move throughout the whole city in the, uh, in, the in a safe environment um, so hopefully that can be accomplished if we move forward the other question I guess and I do have a question is is active transportation is fine the trails fine I think a tremendous asset but one of the biggest uh, deterrents to uh, <laughs> safe active transportation is, is crosswalk safety um, and and uh, I, I guess the question is: do you, is, is there anything in the, in any of the planning to uh, to improve crosswalk safety in the city? <coughs> the, just back to the first point, uh, that linear map was basically the agenda for our meeting with the working committee. Cause they were looking for projects. They're obviously the province is in an eager state because they've got budgets to approve and they've got to spend the funds this year, so they were looking for shovel-ready projects. So us having that was certainly well in hand and was basically the premise for the whole discussion. Um, yeah, it, as I mentioned, there's four projects that are shovel-ready, I guess you could call it, or we're going to try and get them as close to shovel-ready as we can. But the, f the fifth element that I think we'll pick at each year over the five years is signage, paint, and promotions. Those are kind of the, the key areas that we're looking at. So, you know, having readily available and easy, easily accessible actual transportation maps uh, is one thing that, that residents will want to know when they're trying to find their way to work. But second to that is when they arrive at a crosswalk through from the from rails to trails, as an example, well-marked, well-notified crosswalk areas for active transportation users, and that branding from the mapping will be found at the crosswalk sites uh, as we go along. Now, what I thought we would do is kind of break those apart over a five-year period and so that we have dollars to spend on a project, and then bike racks and signage and for the promotional piece as well. So let's, we're going to try and tie those two things together. Any other questions? Quick, quick uh, follow-up question. Oh, so yeah. is there any indication from the provincial committee that there would be sort of long-term funding on projects that they would buy into a, or is it just an annual intake of applications? And it's an annual intake of applications, but they will consider multi-year phased approaches for okay, the project. Good. good. But only for five years. They won't go beyond this to the year six. Your Worship, do you have a question? I see your lights on there. No, I guess I should leave it on most of the time, but that, that's fine. No worries. Uh, any other questions from councillors regarding active transportation? Uh, if there's no other questions, uh, thank you, JP. Uh, we'll move for adjournment. Thank you, Councillor Adam. Your okay. Worship, back to you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Snow, and uh, as mentioned earlier, the Chair for Police, Fire and Emergency Service is not here tonight, and uh, so we'll have that meeting at another night. And we'll continue on with the Bylaw and Policy Review Committee. Oh, sorry? Oh, Municipal Services is next. Sorry. 
snow removal or snow cleaning. You're cleaning snow or removing it? job though this year I'd like to uh, call the Municipal Services Committee uh, to order and uh, get the approval of the agenda I think Barb is my, you can approve the agenda right perfect thank you all in favor signify by saying aye caught you nay motion carried thank you uh, snow clearing is the first item on the agenda and I know that there's been a couple of questions around uh, snow removal uh, and how we do it basically and uh, timing of what we're doing and I know uh, that uh, we went through every every couple of years or two or three years we seem to have the question come up so uh, we have staff here tonight that uh, can I think there's a presentation do you have Greg we can turn it over to our director Greg Okay, I'll just do, uh, uh, for Council's information, just do the current status of yeah. how we do things and how it's evolved from past Council. So one of the things we've, we always look at trying to be efficient in trying to do snow removal in the city. We always have our challenges as, I say, as the landscape changes. So there's always a few concerns as things change in the downtown core or as things change with developments as well. S new streets, even new houses uh, start uh, using up the vacant lots where we like to push some snow. So we're constantly tweaking it a little bit, just to let people know. But as an overall method for uh, snow removal, there's information on our website for the general public um, that kind of gives our general process of how we go about, I would say, doing a snow removal blitz operation. So just some of the things we do, we, we have two different areas in the city. One, we plow with a contractor, a contract we do every four years, and it's usually timed for the middle of a council term of office. So that way it, it allows, in our opinion, staff's opinion it was a good opinion to allow council to familiarize themselves with the current process, and then they have a chance through their term to tweak it if we need to in any contract negotiations with the contracting areas as well as our own efforts so there's two different areas in the city that we look at so and we have a, a list of equipment and and uh, manpower that we use for doing that in the city um, one of the things we do do though the information on the website needs to be updated a little bit you'll see in front of you some of the number stats that we have and these have changed since this document was created uh, 111 kilometers has now grown to 114 kilometers of streets. So we've added about three mm -hmm. kilometers of streets since last time we looked at this information. The 48 kilometers of sidewalks has grown to approximately 52 with uh, an addition of eight kilometers of boardwalk to do. So that number's probably jumped the largest from 48 to about 60 kilometers of The boardwalk, boardwalk wouldn't have been in there before? No, it was never in this information on the website, so. Okay. That was addition over time. I think it started back in 2008, 2010, and it's continually yes. grown, the boardwalk. Okay. Um, 26 cul-de-sacs, uh, there was two additions on cul-de-sacs that are a little more problematic on doing the circle and trying to figure out how to remove snow in cul-de-sac. That went from 26 to 28. And the 14 municipal building parking lots actually has expanded. The latest count we did was 21, and we started doing a more precise listing of all the park areas so the, for example, the boardwalk has a parking area we have to clean, and the shipyard market has a uh, parking lot we have to clean, and the city of Summerside assists the GST center, and we clear out the church parking lot mm -hmm. to help them for parking to get off the roads a bit. Mm -hmm. So those are the type of things we've added over the years, but it's about 21 now, and we also clean out more park, park areas for parking that are snow activities in the winter to help out community services. So things have grown a bit. Um, on top of that, we also do our all our own snow removal on all the water utility and sewer utility infrastructure. So some of the strategies we use um, that we do is, of course, it's very variable on the weather, and uh, it really depends on what we think the snow is going to hit it, hit us and how fast. And uh, usually the timings we put out to everyone is a less than 20 centimeter snowfall event. 
And what that really means is we don't really need to get into blower work too much. Usually that can be pushed with plows and blades, which is much quicker than blower work. And that's really where we get the timings from. There are times, of course, when we, we make the wrong judgment call and snow gets ahead of us or something like that. And those are usually the times when complaints happen the most is when we make a, a bad judgment. But just to give you an idea of the sequence, so what we normally do with the plowing equipment is all the plows will hit the main streets first. Um, you have to open the main streets first so people can travel from their subdivision to a business and back and forth. So we always start with the main roads, which are the high volume areas, and then we work out to the subdivisions. And it's been a set order for many years. Um, we do have a s the main collectors get done first, and then we start at a certain spot and work our way back through, through the main road. So normally what we'll do is we'll send out the plows first, and then about a couple hours later, we'll get into the sidewalk machines because the plows push the snow off and a lot of times it ends up on the sidewalks mm -hmm. and then the sidewalks get pushed out with the snow plows. So you'll always see the sidewalk machine starting anywhere from two to three hours after the plows start. And that usually, so a lot of times our sidewalk routes go along with the plows. If we had to change the sidewalk route, we'd have to wait till the plow was totally finished after five hours or six hours of event before we could start the sidewalk machines. So this way we get a jump on the sidewalks a bit. They don't always mesh well with certain sensitive areas of sidewalks, but that's the reason why we do it that way. Um, Might add to that, especially this year, that early snowfall we had that turned ice. Yes, that was early big ice that turned to snow. <laughs> and yep. I, I, there's still pieces of that around. It's uh, yeah, it, it's one cement. One, one one particular spot was around the Journal Pioneer. Um, I guess that'd be the uh, condominiums there on the corner of Queen and Water. We actually had to take a backhoe to, to scrape it off the sidewalk. It was that bad. The blowers couldn't push the it or anything. We had to actually smash it with the backhoe. Yeah. So there were some difficult areas for sure. I live up in Collin and, and I'm in the Rotary Park every day. When is that listed too, the trails? They've been doing a heck of a job there this year. The trails have been. That's really done by community services. Community we can't services. take credit for that. They've been grooming that really well. They've got a lot of active use at the Rotary Park for their they're biking and snowshoeing yeah. and that's a lot great. of their efforts. So, so that being said, I'll, I'll get into some of the just some of the, the issues we deal with for the city, and just gives you an idea the last little while of the highs and the lows of the snow accumulation. So, everybody probably remembers the 2014, 2015 year where we call it Snowmageddon, and we had 480 centimeters of of snow fall that year, which was a huge amount of snow, and a lot of people in the community suffered from that snow. Uh, and the lowest was 144 in 2010 and 2011. So it's quite a range, but we see about 280 on average in Summerside. So this was something we did to the past council's term. So we talked about what's important. Um, timely, obviously, is important, efficient. We try to communicate as best we can on Facebook for updates, social media, where and when we can. And we try to be meticulous, so we try not to be too adverse to people that we understand have concerns of where we put snow and where we try to do it. Um, if, if the city didn't have the cooperation of citizens and their understanding, you'd probably end up having a lot more cost for trucking snow away in certain areas rather than be able to push it in vacant lots and things like that. Our standard procedure when we do that is to coordinate with the landowner to ask them if it's okay because it's their land. So we ask them to do that before we go ahead and do that. So previous council, we had a little variance in our timing when we did some analysis. We saw a four and a half hour time frame for, I'll call the, uh, the old town or, or before it was amalgamated. And then the one where you had the contractors, we had a five and a half hour time frame. So there's almost an hour in the difference. So when we re-looked at doing, doing the events, we found that the outside contract expanded to 61 kilometers and inside stayed at 51. So what we ended up doing, we changed the routes. So what you can see here on the map is a red, the red and blue are the contractor routes that were redesigned. And then our city internal forces, we had upgraded equipment to put some extra wings on some equipment. So we're able to take over more of the area from the contractor. So we balanced it out to create a five hour time frame for everyone in the city from start to finish. At the same time, when we did this, we took a lot more kilometers, but it was the kilometers with the bigger lanes with the plow, which would cover faster distance. What we did 
um, with the two wings and the plows, we actually saved the city at that time approximately $50,000 a year by dropping one, at one route by the contractors and taking on more area. So we saved, saved a few dollars, used our equipment better, and then uh, also made a more consistent level of service for everyone in the city. And you saved about 50% of the phone calls. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, so uh, or probably 70% of the phone calls. Some yes. people. So that's where it's at right now, and how we split it up. We made some adjustments last time, and the and the, the important piece for council is the next opportunity. It's the last year, this year for the snow contract. So we'll be going out this year for a new contract. So, do you plan to expand what you just finished saying there a minute ago? We we investigated doing all services internally for a while, but uh, we found that. With the equipment investment and the staff power, staff manning power investment, it was less expensive to keep with the contractor at that time. Our research found that we could lease equipment at a lower rate, but Moncton had done that, and then they found that the leasing rates changed a few years after, and it didn't become viable anymore. No, we just said earlier that you expanded and saved fifty thousand. We did. So yeah. if you expand again, you lose the fifty thousand. Is that what you're saying? Well, no, it becomes a balance of how much yeah. gear we need to invest in versus the savings. So that was, yeah. we, we, we are always constantly analyzing it and trying to figure out what's the best way to use taxpayer dollars for the service level is what we try to maintain. Mm -hmm. One of the things just for council's information, we all know fuel costs are rising, diesel fuel is always rising and oil prices rising. It's a dollar, over a dollar a liter at the pump for diesel fuel. Um, back in the day, so you can get an idea of the rising costs of snow and salting for the community. Is there such a thing as electric snow plows? There is not at this time, but uh, we could definitely save a few dollars if we could find something that would work mm -hmm. well. Or if it's not possible to find one? Not, not designed at this time, not available for technology that I'm aware of. Um, so just to give you an idea, in, in, the, in the nine years we did this analysis, 132 percent the snow and salt costs rose over those nine years. Uh, property taxes went up 32%. Sorry, property value assessments, not <coughs> rate. Did you see last week there was a story on one of the cities, was it Finland or, or China, was it? They had solar panels on, on the streets. Oh, the melting the snow, I guess, before it got there. Yeah, that's interesting technology for sure. Um, so the, the other side is the CPI index is 16% it rose. So you can see that the consumer price index is, and the costs of other things are weighing the consumer price index. So, and some of those reasons though too is that these are the costs year over year and they pretty well match two factors, which is the price of fuel, which is a consumable for the year. And the other one is the amount of snow times we have to act to. That's why the green line is kind of the costs of the variance from year to year on costs, so you can see how it's all over the place, and they pretty well match accumulation of uh, snowfall. You've been in the past 15? It's 2015, is it? Yeah, no, this is when the last time this was done for the last contract. Yeah. We'll oh. do this analysis again this year before we go out to contract to make sure we're, we're as efficient as we can for the next contract to see what we can do. And that's just some of the numbers from the last time of what the Sorry, tendered but costs were. Another question on that. Is that the increase? And the cost or the increase of snow? Both factors in there. That's, so what, that, what this is trying to show you is that it was a 40% increase in 2008 when oil went really high and it was $1.20 a liter. And, along, and then the next year in 2010, we actually reduced it by 30%. So it has a lot to do with snow accumulation and the salt and the weather patterns that we yeah. use to maintain the service levels. And the fuel cost didn't drop a large amount in 2010. It did not, no. It steadily, it steadily kind of goes, if you're, if you're thinking of a line, it, it goes like this, but it's constantly going up. <laughs> There's always something to keep the rabbit's tail short. Mm. So the snowfall to date is, should be, we should be pretty good as. Snowfall is, the, yeah, yeah the uh, salting and, and things too are a little yeah. more frequent, but uh, usually when we have lower snow, snow accumulations, the overall budget is reduced a little bit. Right. Um, these are just some of the costs from the last contract of how we did it and what we saved, <coughs> just to give some people some ideas. So what we always try to do is, some people would say, think the mind about service levels is about equality, but not every service is designed for every individual. So 
so we try to like to say that our snow removal is designed where it needs to be in the city. For example, we go in and we do an extra blitz in the downtown area because it's condensed and there's nowhere to push snow. So a couple of days after a storm, we've got that area cleaned out because there's less air to use. So that's, that's an additional service, you would say, for that area just because of the condition it's in. So we try to do what's on the, the right there, which is equity, which is put the resources where they're needed. You had mentioned that there's no electric snow plows. But I mean, we've got electric cars and electric trucks, and I believe they have electric buses now. Uh, what size of tractor do they have electric tractors of any kind? I guess I, I'm just curious to see what's down the road a year or two or three, you know, what the inventions that may be coming out. There hasn't been anything that I've seen in any articles or anything promoting any designs or even what's to come next for what I'll say municipal work equipment heavy duty gear that's fully electric there are some they're toying around with some transfer truck ideas um, that haven't really come to market yet um, there are trolley <coughs> systems in cities that are electric that use the overhead wires for powering their gear but nothing in the snow removal equipment that I'm aware of but they have electric buses right they do they're just starting with them so electric trucks with plows in the front is not possible either. Definitely possible, just hasn't been designed yet. And the cost, the cost could be quite large <coughs> at this point for those. Even that the vehicles are just getting to be um, cost effective over a six or seven year ownership. Um, I, I, that was a presentation for the snow. Uh, if anybody has any questions on any concerns of late. Any questions, Carrie? Mm -hmm. I just wanted to say thank you because I know out in Ward 8, I'm not sure if we figured out it was a new driver or what, but there was just some areas that weren't seeing the um, the coverage that they had before, so that was great. Um, I really appreciate that, and so did they. And also to the province because we I just I made a couple calls and they were great to come out that little merge lane that some mm -hmm. residents had some concerns about and um, yeah that was all taken care of so we're good, good. to go till the next round so great thanks guys you usually you get the good complaints at the start of the season yeah. and yeah. in fairness operations are still fine-tuning some of their things as well so. deputy mayor um, I think I think municipal services you, you folks do a great job and uh, sometimes it's really hard trying to get everything fit in, but just seeing the presentation tonight can really understand how you have a, a sequence that you follow. I wanted to ask a question. Um, I know it's more, you know, with bylaws and, and policing aspect, but when you folks are out plowing around the city streets, do you run into many, vi many vehicles that are parked? Like, we've had some questions lately on overnight parking and uh, whether or not there's a storm forecast, possibly it could be on, you know, on Facebook. But I'm, I'm just wondering, and I don't want to put you on the spot, but do you run into many situations like that where that creates any type of uh, a problem for the snow plows when they're out in, in, you know, really high areas where there's snowstorms? Sure. There, there's. Um, we met as a group, the CAO, myself, and uh, the police chief met on on discussion of. Uh, I think it was the parking ban bylaw. And we had a few discussions on what the issue may be, and um, we brought in discussion on parking spaces for certain individuals or certain even certain areas of the city that may have a use for additional parking on the street that's kind of less restrictive, I guess. Currently, the parking ban today goes from uh, 1 a.m. in the morning until a 6 a.m. And the reason mainly for that is we as operations normally will do a cleanup run to get everybody home, but we do a really final cleanup curb to curb in those wee hours from one to six when there's less traffic, businesses aren't open, so there's less cars around mm -hmm. anywhere. But just to give you an idea on some, we did take some pictures actually of this, so some pictures of a plow maneuvering around a, a particular car. There are a few that still, that still um, get out there and uh, the guys do have to work around, the operators, sorry the operator staff. So it just gives you an idea of the big equipment and size of the car and you can see that's the wing he has to bring up to get around the car and those type of things. So the operators are really skilled and, and running the gear 
and you just give an idea of, of how good they are and how close they can drop the blade to the car. However, mistakes do happen too. <laughs> Nobody's perfect, so the odd time we do have an insurance claim sometimes for some car damage. The cars are longer than others, eh? Yeah. <laughs> the, the, bigger, the bigger issue for us is not so much the plows. They deal with that fairly regularly. Not a huge amount, but they deal with it. It's the sidewalk. If you look here on the side of the car here, there's a sidewalk right there that is a sidewalk that also makes a curb. So the sidewalk's right there and the car is right there. And the blade on the snow plow is about five feet wide. And the sidewalk is about four foot eight. So what happens is the blade and the machines there are articulating, so they wiggle a little bit as you go. So the, the operators get very nervous of trying to do a good job on the sidewalk and not hit the vehicle. So that's one of the concerns we have for uh, allowing cars. And that's just the result. Here is the result of a of uh, the guys and how close they can get to the vehicle when they go around. But what happens, two things happen, is when the person wants to move their vehicle, they have to, not everybody owns a Jeep like, like this individual. I'm not sure if a Honda Civic would get through that. And there could be some complaints there on, on that. And then if it hardens, they can actually damage their car with going over the, the snow hump. So there's some concerns there. But uh, normally what happens, and we'd have to go back and clean that up later once the car moves. But it wouldn't necessarily have to be an overnight, like open at 4 o'clock or 5 o'clock in the evening. And just Absolutely. Yeah, and then at so the I same... I, I thought that was a, an overnight parking ticket on the side yeah. there, but it's not. No, no, definitely not. I, we did ask the police how many tickets they actually gave, and they didn't have an answer for us right away, but they said they used due diligence in creating warnings and things. And, and this is some of the downtown area. Now, this is a much lighter snow, but you get an idea how close they can come to the vehicles, and, and they do push a pretty good pretty good deal for the for the plows so you just get an idea of some of the vehicles we did take some pictures this year so these are daytime pictures it, we just Even have an yet. overnight parking ban right place. but we wanted to show some yeah. situations where we do yeah. work around vehicles that are yeah. in the space That's fine. and they're not they're okay to be there right because normally what we'll do here is we'll go through and clean what we can and then schedule another event in the wee hours when most vehicles are gone anyway um, okay. uh, I, I was the Councillor, that he brought this forward, I guess, asking about the overnight parking ban. And to Bruce's point, these are daytime pictures. I guess, in in my thought of the whole thing was that this already occurs where cars are parked during daytime as we're clearing that sort of. Thing. My idea of our parking ban, whether or not it's even possible, could it be revised? Would be that there would be a strict parking ban. Obviously, we wouldn't. Uh, do it during the daytime hours in the downtown business core and other areas, but side streets, et cetera, when we know there's a storm, a storm has come, a parking ban goes into place, and then it's in place until such time we the roads are cleared, all the side roads, et cetera, but in the downtown core, you obviously you'd be able to park during the business time. But I, 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 my, in my opinion, there's nothing stopping a car from doing this exact same thing as we're plowing, so we still have to either come back or my, my idea or my thought was that a parking ban would go into place, it'd be a period of time, nobody could park on the streets during that time, but then as we know, there's long periods of time, say for the last couple of days, the streets are in perfect shape for a car to park tonight on the road, there's really no issue whatsoever. You might get some salt on your tire, but you're going out salt and it's not gonna be affected by a car sitting there. So I'm wondering, that that's where the questions came to me from, mm -hmm. is why can't I park? I was actually out uh, uh, having a coffee at one of the places the other day and, and somebody said to me, I really hope you could get that parking ban because the, they just don't have a place to park during certain time. Right. So, so I, I don't know, it, it, I, I totally respect everything our workers do. I think they do a great job. Um, but as I said when I brought it up, if we're not looking for ways to improve stuff, then I think we're wasting our time sitting around here. That we always got to be thinking of ways things can improve, and if it can, it can't. But that, that, that was my idea. So, some of the initial research on that that we did talk about is uh, City of Moncton has a pilot right now going on for removing a parking ban. And they're waiting for results to see how, waiting for feedback from, I guess, the operations crew on how effective it was. The other thing we also talked about in, at the the meeting we held with the CAO was uh, residential parking permits that they some have in Charlottetown where they don't have enough parking for the housing development. So you could you could look at different options of, mm -hmm. of restricting the parking ban just to certain areas where they have less parking opportunities. 
and also identify the need of the residents through an application process or something for the need of a parking space in the road right away. So things like that could be the, the dynamics of the family change and now they have four cars, like for two kids and two adults and you know, is that acceptable for the city to accommodate the right of way parking space? And then if there is an allocation of the right of way parking space, does it come for a fee? So there's all those discussions that the, we initially talked about at the meeting with the CAO and the police yeah. chief and we are working on it. We're just not there yet as to what some options might be. We did also discuss about a, a communication plan to get some of the notifications out too. So we're just not quite there yet as a, as a group, but I think we're still working on it. Councilor Snow, just to follow up on that, uh, Greg that. has touched on some of the discussions that the, myself and he and the, the chief of police have had on this issue. And it's our intent to flesh these potential ideas and options out a little bit more so because we want to bring it back here to council for more of a discussion. And I'm not trying to sidetrack uh, the discussion here because I know it is on snow clearing and uh, snow removal schedules, but we'd like to be able to bring back some recommendations to council in the not too distant future. We just got to finish, I guess, a little bit of work that we're doing in that regard. And, and it's important, I know that I also had some constituents reach out and say, don't you ever <laughs> get rid of that snow parking ban. So so yeah. it, it goes yeah. both ways, yeah. right? So, but but. I had people ask, so that's where we bring it forward, so. Perfect, okay, Councillor. Two quick points, one one uh, relating to the, f the conversation we were just having there, and I'm thinking about that ever since uh, Councillor Snow raised that, you know, how we can accommodate that, and I'm wondering if one of the options worthy to be looked at would be, you know, that's, that the resident, and I don't know how far reaching it is, but for the most, of the city, I don't think the parking ban's an issue. And that, that if there is residence where it is a little bit of an issue, if they could register, and you have some kind of a blast uh, text message that goes out and say, you know, tonight you need to get your car off the street type of thing, mm -hmm. uh, that there'd be a process for them to register and, and, and whether that would be a compromise that would, yeah. would meet their needs, something, something like that. Absolutely. The other point I want to make regarding snow removal and I travel to quite a few cities in this, in this city in the run of a year, in this uh, country in the run of the year, and you know, uh, I was in two last week, and I mean, our snow removal is so superior to what I see. You know, I mean, I, I, I've never been in another municipality that has had, that's had the quality of snow removal that we have here, and I, I, sometimes I think people take it for granted. But man, I was in I was in Ottawa, and Montreal last week, and. Uh, you can hardly get out. You, can, you know, walk in and eat and go out for dinner or something. You can hardly, you can hardly get down the street, and uh, you know it, it was a disgrace, really. And um, uh, you know, our residents wouldn't put up with it. Here. But, um, so, uh, kudos to uh, the team that look after that. I would. I just like to sum up too that I agree with Councilor McPhilly, and it's the staff that are here in Summerside that are. I'll say the boots on the ground. If you ever watch Curse of Oak Island, that's what they like to say. The boots on the ground are really what make the end result for the work effort. So I think the guys during the winter, they very rarely have a sick day, very rarely miss any hours of need for the city. So they're a great bunch and dedicated loyal staff, for sure. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, just, sorry, go ahead, Justin. Oh, I just had a question. Um, if, in a, if an incident were to occur between one and six, you know, like where, where a car was damaged, would the city be liable for that or would the car owner be liable for that? Uh, nor normally in any accidents, the, the moving vehicle that would normally be held responsible. So if the vehicle was parked and it was damaged, it would be responsible city of Summerside insurance to be, to make amends. Yeah. I would Even normally, in the case of a bylaw? Usually that's right, unless, unless it's shown to be totally egregious, like start, stopped in the middle of an intersection or okay. something like that. But I think if it's parked on the side of the road, unless it was ticketed, even if it was ticketed, then the city of Summerside would have known it was there. So the question becomes, you know, why did the operator make a mistake and hit it? So I would assume that it would be our responsibility. Okay. Yes, thanks. Yeah, I'll just sum up here a couple of things, but uh, Councilor McFeely, you're right. And I, this is across the country a number of times over the years in, in a lot of cities and towns. In some places, they didn't even clean the sidewalks. And, you know, I, I remember being at one place that must have been a foot of snow and it was packed. And 
And the people there said, well, if you want to clean it, you've got to get them clean their cells in front of the business. But uh, so we got uh, pretty good service here in the city and we commend your staff. And just before I go back to uh, the chair, we had mentioned about uh, our employee, Thane. Thane Jenkins' mother passed away, but uh, oh. I wanted to mention as well, uh, my friend in Kensington, uh, former mayor, Gerald McCarville, I've known him for years and uh, passed away. And uh, he was a fine gentleman and I've traveled with him a lot to meetings of the EI Federation of Municipalities and FCM over the years. And he'd always go to bat for Kensington. And uh, so I was out to his wake and passed on condolences from our city. And also, our deputy mayor's uncle passed away last week, uh, Councillor McCormick, uh, Harry Lackey, and we all know and saw and heard he was one of the best fiddlers and I was mm. going to say in the world, maybe I could still say that, but he was really noted for his music and uh, so we pass on condolences to, to the family. And that's all I have, Mr. Okay. Chairman. Great, thank you. I think that's all the comments. I just want to uh, thank you, Greg, for the presentation. I know that this, uh, this policy that we have now has been uh, uh, built from a long list of complaints and, and a lot of uh, experience over, over the years. And, and, and I just want to say that the last time we did this and when we did expand the city uh, part of it, it was phenomenal uh, because I was the one that was calling almost every snowstorm. I, I was getting calls in the middle of the night, you know, and once we changed it, bang, it, it went away. So I really appreciate the work that the guys do. And yes, we are very fortunate. We have phenomenal snow clearing here. You don't have to go far to, to find uh, that we're right. So good, thank you very much. And we'll turn uh, it over to Troy. Councillor McDougall, yes. can I just say something? Just yes. to add to what, echo yes. what you're saying. Yes. Um, I think with Tropical Storm Dorian, sometimes there, there might have been people make comments about the electric or you know, the lines or whatever. But I, I also think that uh, a lot of the times our residents do get a bit protective of the crews because I've heard them say sometimes either Facebook or publicly or at the coffee shop, well, you get up there in that plow and you try, see how you're going to do. Or else something about, you know, being up in the bucket in 80, you know, the winds being really high. So I think our residents really do for, you know, really appreciate the efforts. Good. Thank you. We uh, now have a presentation on climate risk and resilience <laughs> assessment report. That's right. That's right. How are you doing? All right. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, um, uh, Mayor Stewart and Council. I um, I was involved with this uh, project from from the beginning, mm -hmm. and um, Quest. What's that? Oh yes, sorry. Uh, Gerald Giroux with the electrical department. I'm the electrical engineer. And um, so this. Uh, this presentation, what I did was uh, Quest had to make a presentation to NRCAN with regards to uh, this uh, report that they did for communities. They did it for six communities across Canada. And um, so I just uh, revised it a bit so that it mostly pertained to what, what we would be interested in. The, the first few slides I'll probably go through rather quickly. Um, if there is some questions, we can uh, we can deal with that. But um, I wanted to get to the report part of it. So a little tiny bit of information about Quest. They're they're a, a national nonprofit organization, and um, they, like I said uh, before, they were hired by NRCAN to generate this report. And uh, and we all know the importance of of climate change and how it's affecting us and they wanted to actually develop a guide that other municipalities will be able to use. So this was kind of like a pilot project to develop that guide. So this is a simple uh, definition of uh, resilience. At its simplest level, resilience is being empowered by being aware of your situation, your risks, vulnerabilities, and current capabilities to deal with them. 
and being able to make informed tactical and strategic decisions. So the issue that we were dealing with is that municipalities across Canada are already uh, dealing with climate change impacts and I, I think we can definitely see that happening here in, in Summerside. Uh, cost of uh, damage to all these infrastructures are rising and 90% uh, of Canadian electrical utilities have also been impacted. This slide here is showing the, the, the rate at which uh, insured losses in Canada are rising and this graph does not include any uninsured costs that are bared by the by either municipalities or or customers could I just just tell them that there the insurance loss is rising loss is rising would that become uh, more people are would it be more incidents or could it be just uh, uh, more people trying to see if they can get insured? I'm just wondering how the, that stat fits in there. Yeah, well they, I mean you can kind of see within this, uh, in the slide they show some of our, some of our major um, incidents over the years, like there's an ice storm and uh, uh, Fort McMurray fire and all of those types of, like these types of claims for insurance are all related to climate climate change. There may be what you're saying. There may be s some of that going on, but the general trend is showing that these are a lot of these are occurring because of of damage. Like um, for instance, we just uh, had with Dorian. It's um, you know it's almost I think it was almost uh, close to a million dollars in in damage overall. So. In the report, uh, there is some there, there's some climate context involved. Um, there, this uh, this slide here is just showing some some things like, for instance, here in Summerside, uh, in 20 in 2080, we're going to have about 40 and a half days where the temperature is over 29 degrees Celsius. So that means we'll have more uh, heating load in the summer, uh, cooling loads in the summer. Um, and they also talk a little bit about, um, they're, they're also showing about the, you can see there's a picture there on coast, uh, coastal, uh, coastal damage. And so one, one example they have for like dealing with coastal damage is you can, you can either avoid it, uh, don't build in the areas that you've designated at, as risk, or you can protect it by building a wall and uh, accommodate is you know, adapting your structures to uh, to work with that with, you with those problems. You had mentioned the degrees in 2080. Yes. From what was the amount of the change? I didn't catch that. So this based on yeah, I just went back to it. So based on the way if the greenhouse gases the way they're going, like um, they, they call this uh, business as usual. If we don't do anything about our greenhouse gases with the current models. They're showing that in 2080, um, they, 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 they did this analysis using Environment Canada's um, information, and it shows that by 2080 that, well, I mean, so if we look now, roughly 2020, it shows here that we have about 6.8 days that are over 29 degrees Celsius, and so in 60 years' time, it will go up to 40 and a half days. Better get more golfing in there. <laughs> <laughs> 60 years time. Somebody's a job. <laughs> yeah. Appreciate yeah. that information. Yeah, there's uh, actually, there's a wealth of information in this report. Um, Quest did an excellent job. It, um, it was, I think it was uh, very good for, uh, for us to take advantage of uh, this because actually uh, at this go around, NRCAN paid the bill for this work to, to be done for the six communities. <laughs> but that's one thing that does tax our, that's one thing that does affect our storm drain system, right? 
So one of the things we're seeing more often in operations is as these freeze thaw cycles happen, we've got to get out with our backhoes more often and clean out the ditches and the manhole covers and the catch basins and things, right? To protect people's property. Ditches, you mean? So from the energy, uh, sorry, emergency management perspective, one of the things that we, we know is that we ask everyone to be self-sufficient for 72 hours, 72 to 96 hours. And then in, in, in any emergency beyond that, we have to, the municipality has to uh, step in. And um, so these are the, the things that the municipality will have to keep in mind as, as, uh, as time goes on. And from the utilities perspective, um, in the, through this study, I know um, in New Brunswick, for instance, they found out that there was, uh, the National Building Code was uh, inadequate for their actual ice loadings um, they, they, in some areas of New Brunswick. So there's kind of like a National Building Code that you can use um, for uh, snow loading and whatnot on, on buildings and whatnot, but for the utility, that they have their code, and using the national code, they've uh, they found that there's some areas where it was actually 400% higher than than what they had designed for. So these types of things have to be also uh, considered. And um, in this in this slide, uh, it just shows all the tools and resources that Quest used uh, to perform the uh, to perform. Uh, their investigation and, and then uh, de develop the report. A um, couple of things, uh, we had uh, two workshops right here in, in Summerside and, uh, and then we filled out a, a fair amount of information and, uh, and they, they did a, a actually a, a baseline survey of, 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 of getting the information from our various departments. So this is a few pictures from some of the team um, building and planning alignment where we discussed uh, basically they had printed off maps of uh, of the area and so we could uh, highlight areas where that we thought is uh, at risk for uh, climate change and, and actually yeah, it'll it actually you can see on one of the maps or one of the pictures there there's a map that's showing the uh, where the flood uh, will be in, in roughly about 100 years time. And so we kind of looked at infrastructure and whatnot in those areas to see how they might be affected. So when, once um, Quest, you know, g gathered all that information, had the workshops and um, whatnot, they basically uh, had, um, they, they generated the report with the annexes, which which we have, and then they also have a, a recommendations report that kind of lists off uh, things that they that that they and we like. This was a collaborative effort. Um, they did get our input, and um, so they developed the recommendation table basically. And uh, we'll we'll take a look at one as an example to see how how it can be used in, in the future. And um, then this is, uh, this information variety can be used in our EMO strategy uh, with the EMO committee and whatnot and, and strategies going forward. And then they provided, they're gonna provide, the, use this, like I said before, as a template for a guide for other communities to be able to follow and develop this for themselves. And then in this project, uh, with those six communities, they will be doing an annual follow-up for the next three years. That's part of the project, and then they will do a final report when that is that is over with. So now we'll look into what uh, parts of our report. I just uh, like I said there's there's a huge amount of information in there, so I just pulled uh, bits and pieces out of it. Um, this is here are just four of the climate projections. Um, within that report, and I believe there's about 22 of them in, in the report. And so that top left graph is the same one we were talking about earlier, where it shows that, you know, now in 2020, we only have 6.8 days over 29, and then in 2080, 
uh, it's going to be 40.5. And this uh, this report is um, basically, like I said before, based on business as usual. If we don't start doing something about our greenhouse gases in Canada, then this is where we're we're heading. And so this is a, a picture that was developed for our city showing basically uh, the year 2100 where we will where we can have flooding up to on the on the coastal areas and so like I said through our when we did our workshops we kind of looked around those areas and see uh, and, and, and seeing what uh, what infrastructures and, and and how it can affect and you can see like uh, most of the downtown um, like by the wharf and whatnot is, is pretty heavily affected. So what you just mentioned there, they say less than 2% of emissions are caused by Canada sort of thing in the world. And the other countries, uh, China and, and others, uh, it, it doesn't seem to be decreasing somewhat. So uh, are we catching up any? Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. Well, it, it's that's that's kind of what everyone like. I'm a I'm a very environmental person. I've always been. I shut my lights off the second I leave a room. That kind of stuff. And um, and everyone usually kind of kind of jokes with me and they said, "Listen, Gerald, you're really good at that." But there's somebody in China who <laughs> who's just putting smoke up a stack uh, and uh, defeating your purpose. But I. I really think, I mean, it's, it's going to take a while. Um, I think the younger generation is way more educated and more aware of what's going on. Like uh, Greta Thunberg is, is pretty impressive. Um, yeah, we only do uh, accommodate like 2% of the world's greenhouse problem, but it, every, every little bit helps. And like Summerside, one of the things that always impressed me, me about Summerside um, I've only been with the city for, for, for two years, but I've lived here um, for, for a long time, is how progressive it is. And everything, like almost every project we're doing is helping us uh, be more energy efficient and, and environmentally conscious. So I think it's, it's um, this, a lot, a lot of this report kind of, you, you'll see there, there's some things in the recommendations we've already implemented just recently, and so we're kind of like ahead of the curve that way. I mean, no question. We're certainly doing our part here. Yes. But when you watch, you read stories about some other parts of the world where they're not doing enough, uh, are we catching up? But I guess well, that all remains to be seen. Yeah, well, that's where you kind of hope that this stuff has to go to the United Nations, like the UN and, and whatnot, to, to have global um, buy-in. Um, everyone should realize that uh, this affects all of us. We're, in a way, we're breathing in the air from China. For, you know, here, so. <laughs> well, one of the one of the important things of this document is to help the city build a resilience plan, and its and its decision making is important too. Where do you build the infrastructure? Where do you reinforce it? What type of land use planning you can protect against those type of things? It's really a reference document for that type of stuff. And also your emergency measures organization can help plan from this document from the risks that may come down the road. So um, uh, the next few, quite a, the, quite a few of the next few slides that have a lot of uh, words on them. So I'm not gonna read all of them, um, but it's, uh, there's, there's, there's a few sections where I'll, I'll kind of mention this, from this assessment, uh, on this slide, we're showing some of the key hazards of concern. And um, so, like the atmosphere is, you know, showing some of the things that we see. Uh, we know that uh, surges have been uh, occurring a little bit more often. Um, and one of the things they mentioned in here, it's that, it's that same number. Uh, there is expected to be a quadruple a number of hot days above 30 degrees Celsius, uh, so there'll be less in the, uh, relief at night and whatnot. Um, 
under hydro hydrological uh, concerns. There's the coastal flooding, sea level rise, and in, intense rainstorms. Power, power and water outages uh, due to either winds or ice loading on power lines, and um, hazardous uh, material spills. That's uh, mainly uh, one of the reasons that this is here, is just because we we mostly have one uh, one road of throughput to to bring everything up up west. So uh, there's just gives us a little more chance of that happening, and. Um, and, and fuse, uh, food shortages uh, is uh, a, a concern because of the basically the Confederation Bridge, which could possibly close uh, due to severe weather times during the time of the year. So, depending on if uh, the enough food is in the area, that we may have to think of other um, avenues to to get that. So, some of the highlights of the strengths uh, strengths of what we're already doing in Summerside. Um, the local radio station has backup power. Uh, the use of social media and electronic communication is, is, is really well in, in Summerside. Some of the highlights of, uh, in, of strength in the, in the planning area. Um, city Council knows their roles and responsibilities. Um, working on uh, updating the contact tree inventory of resources and equipment, considering climate change projections impacts when making infrastructure and land use planning decisions. Again, with uh, highlights uh, of strengths in the energy infrastructure, um, we have backup power for City Hall and EMO Public Works, so, uh, municipal facilities and lift stations are already uh, hooking up for backup power and we have a mobile backup generator. Um, the, electric, uh, the electric utility maintains a list of oxygen users and others uh, of, of concern. Uh, hospitals and schools and some EM shelters are ready for backup power. Yeah, well, actually, our hospital, our hospital does have backup power. Yeah. So the highlight of strengths is uh, continued. Um, so under, um, for instance, water and sewage, um, we have distributed potable water system, se separated storm water and sewer systems and backup power for water and wastewater tree plant lift stations. Also under highlight of the strengths for, and food, we have food is delivered by truck in the community and there is a small community garden and uh, greenhouse. The community garden is, uh, it's on, yeah, there's one on, um, yeah. Yeah. Notre Dame, yeah. Notre Dame Central. Central. Yeah. They're small. Yeah. No. They're small. Yeah. That's probably one of the bigger risks is the food shortage through the bridge for them and the other. Yeah. The in the, in this report, they're trying to factor in all those types of uh, of of uh, assets that you could use, and so that was one of the questions. They said, "Well, do you have any?" community gardens and then we kind of list it off. So it's small, but it's a, it's a start. So that was a highlight of uh, strengths. So now um, the next few slides will talk about the highlights of areas for improvement. So under communications and awareness, more education and engagement is needed. Develop proactive resilience education strategy. Inform residents of evacuation routes priority of power restoration and preparedness. Uh, ensure secondary diesel supply for di uh, diesel or for backup generators, including communication towers, are available. Should this back up? Yep. Thing, sorry. The one at school was there. Mm -hmm. So should we go a little further than just encourage the local schools or should presentations be made to the students or to the teachers or to whomever? 
Yeah, this, well, I said this was meant to be this guide, and yeah. it's, and like I said, uh, once, uh, now now that it's been completed, so now the EMO committee can review it and decide right. how, that, uh, what we did, whenever we generated the report, um, everyone who was involved kind of put their input in, and so we kind of guessed that the uh, priorities and uh, and and durations and whatnot. So it's it's meant to be used as a guide. So once um, once the committee does review, and then they can choose whichever priorities are. But yeah, it, I mean that to me that is the key. If you can get into the education um, and system early and and make the make make our youth aware, I think it does make um, our community stronger that way. And, and realizing. Um, that there are, at the very least, like there's some easy things that they can discuss about, well, turn the light off when you leave the room. That's a pretty easy uh, thing to to promote. And then if they use this report to say, look, if we don't make any changes, uh, you know, t at the year 2100, the sea level is gonna rise by one meter or whatever it's gonna be. And so now we'll have to worry about, you know, some of our, some of our community because of that. So some more highlights for areas of improvements under planning, organization, coordination. Um, some things we have is like consider climate change in all capital investment and planning decisions. Imp improve regulations for housing and development to take climate risk into account. Enforce new building codes and land use regulations. And, uh, and then yeah, need access to funding. Uh, but that's pretty much uh, I feel that can be said for almost anything. Um, and then highlights for uh, areas of improvement under energy infrastructure. Um, some emergency shelters are without backup power. Uh, I know we're working on, on one right now. Um, Just to highlight on that, um, uh, electrical engineering and community services working together to, to come up with a solution for emergency backup power at One West Drive that came about for trying to create a warming slash cooling center for the community. So that's one of the things that we're already actioning in the report. Um, uh, opportunity to work with the utility to understand hazards and reduce risk from prolonged interruptions to power and fuel delivery. <coughs> Unknown if flood risk to electrical uh, utility infrastructure has been fully assessed for one in 100 year and one in 200 year flood levels. Some more areas of improvement under vegetation and control, or sorry, vegetation and bioretention um, could promote or incentivize uh, more bio bioretention in the community and could implement uh, policies to reduce risk of forest fires impacting the community. Underwater and sewage, um, we, the local uh, storm, storm sewers can handle one in 10 years events. The only major intersections can handle one in 100. Uh, there is a doubling of water to sewage during heavy rainfall due to inflow. Individual and shared wells are vulnerable to power outages. Some more areas of improvement for transportation. On a provincial scale, scale weather can interrupt access to mainland on uh, using the, the bridge or the ferry. Um, some neighborhoods with only one access road and um, the, the city does not have EV charging stations with backup power and the port currently doesn't have uh, backup power. Under food, grocery stores and greenhouses do not have uh, backup power and it's unknown as to how many days of food supply there is in case of interruptions. Uh, this past couple weeks ago, I've been in touch with the mayor of St. John's in Mount Pearl, I've known them for a number of years, and they had to deal with a difficult situation there. And, but a state of an emergency can go from anywhere from a day to how many weeks? So uh, it's, uh, you know, to be prepared so many things that you got to take into consideration and uh, mm. it, 
appears from what I'm reading and from what I saw in the news that they handle their situations well, considering the dump of snow they had. But uh, not necessarily just a snowstorm that something can throw everything off. You know, it can be a, a number of things that could be a state of an emergency. And uh, but we feel we're ready here in the city to deal with it, whatever happens, whatever comes along, and we're always trying to improve what we have in place, and we appreciate this information. Mm -hmm. A lot of these things you're talking about, you know, we have in place, but uh, our new CEA, CEO was responsible for emergency situation if it ever happens, and let's hope it ever does happen. But he's got all of these things uh, that he's working on and, and, and knowledge about, so, and uh, keeping council informed of things, so. But anyway, we really appreciate this information. We're getting near the end here now. Um, yeah, well, as, uh, what you were just saying there is um, it, it does make uh, perfect sense. And and what you'd have to think about what one of the things you have to think about that make sure we're ready is if that if you had something like that happen all across Canada, then you know every province couldn't um, declare a state of emergency. Um, you know you know what I mean. You'd, you want to make sure you're ready and uh, for worst case situation, worst case scenario. Um, yeah, they. It was. I, I was watching that uh, on TV. Uh, how well uh, St. John's did end up uh, dealing with that situation. So. Is that your it, hometown? No, no. Um, the uh, kind of yeah. It's a long story, but Summerside is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so under the key recommendations and priority action section of the report, um, some of the highlights of it, there's, uh, there's, there's actually a section there about securing budget and funding, and there is some references to some places where we can get, and some of them we're very familiar with, like FCM and, and whatnot. Um, some of the other recommendations they have is create a task for to oversee progress in, in an advanced climate adaptation measures to engage community stakeholders and enable collaboration, knowledge exchange, and accountability. Um, establish a quarterly, an annual or quarterly updates to the council and staff and all the public. And develop a climate change adaptation plan and incorporate uh, recommendations from this assessment. So um, continuing on with the key recommendations from the priority uh, actions, um, develop regular community-based exercises for each uh, hazard type, obtain copies of EM plans, and uh, adopt new billing codes. So the, the next slide what I'm going to do is uh, this uh, recommendation here of co uh, obtain copies of EM plans. This next slide is showing in the report that actual recommendation. So each one of those, all those recommendations that are on there has a, uh, a detailed uh, list of, of all the information about that. So, so for instance, in this recommendation, it says obtain copies of EM plans from local schools, hospitals, nursing homes, engage in the task force uh, committee and working group. And the category uh, of the recommendation is planning and coordination and what was said, so basically the what was said was information that was said either workshops or, uh, or gathered from us during the, um, during the process. So Summerside does not have copies of EM plans for local schools, hospitals, and nursing homes. Participants noted, nor for campgrounds, RV, parks, hotels, other organizations with large facilities, and also would need to provide the city's plans to these organizations. Um, who will lead, CIO would support this with the EMO community, and who to engage shows there, like the schools, hospitals, and nursing homes, and then what municipal plans uh, to leverage, uh, not identified, but it could be referred to in the EM plan, and then it lists off some uh, poten potential next steps, and I won't read, read through those, and then the second part of that recommendation shows the, the time frame, um, the priority, 
and and the cost, and they're they're just on ranges. And then and then what uh, Quest did is they provided this uh, matrix for the next three years that you c annually you could revisit and just check off and 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 have the you can keep progress on on each one of the re re recommendations. And you can and and the, again like the this is meant to be a guide so the. Um, all the recommendations we might say, well, of them, we want to do these top 10 or, or whatnot, and then we just kind of keep those um, in, in mind. So uh, th I believe this is my last slide. So um, the recommended steps, there's the EOMA, EMO committee to review uh, this resilient report. Parties should be agreed upon and then uh, look at funding and planning and then review and update the report annually. And as I mentioned before, that, that note as part of this project, Quest will follow up each year for the next three years. And that's it. Thank you, Gerald. Any questions for Gerald? <laughs> I oh, well, yeah, I can, I can give you, I was born in Connecticut but my mom's from, my mom, all my family is from Summerside. My mom, my grandfather, my, my, lots. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Just, so I have uh, dual citizenship. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so if I, uh, if Brian. I can just thank uh, Daryl for his, uh, his, his leadership in this because I, I, I think uh, I raised in, at the September meeting, I think it was about uh, me being a coastal community and my, certainly in my five years on council there had never been uh, any you know I don't recall any discussion about you know the long-term concern about being a coastal community and what the impact would be and I was reading other communities plans around being a coastal community and, uh, and you know, the, the climate adaptation plans that they had in place so uh, it just Again, the stars were aligned because this quest thing was kind of happening at the same time, about to be kicked off at the same time. So I, I did, was able to attend uh, parts of both the workshops. Um, and I was really impressed with the, the quality of the folks from Quest and their, their capabilities. And uh, mm -hmm. um, I, I think this is just a tremendous asset for us as a community to, to be part of. I mean, the, the, we're looking, you know, 80 or 100 years down the road, but the mitigation factors have to happen, have to begin to, to start now. And I was more concerned about it as chair of planning board because there's, you know, we need to begin to look at uh, special building uh, arrangements or restrictions or whatever and begin to get some thought on that. It's a whole lot more than just the, the EMO piece. Um, it, it's really around sort of uh, a mitigating plan that uh, uh, will hopefully uh, eliminate this, eliminate the need to get to the EMO piece. Uh, so uh, thank you again for your, for your work on this. It's great. Thank you. Councillor Campbell. Yes. Um, when I really noticed it, and I guess Bruce might have brought it up at council at that time, was the height that they put the little bridge on down by Colonel Sanders when they were building it, wasn't they had to forecast 50 years away of how high the water's going to move and some of that. And it was quite amazing how high that bridge was put in there. Anybody else? Well, thank you very much, Gerald. Uh, it was a great presentation and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's real. Just don't get wet feet. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, that's all we have for uh, municipal services. I'd, uh, will be adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen and everybody. But I guess there's a couple, couple of items in the committee of the whole. So let's take a five-minute stretch here. Yeah. Oh, s sorry, was there one more? Yeah. Oh, oh, sorry. I didn't see that. Sorry. Oh, yes. Sorry. Yeah. Oh. Sorry, we skipped one there earlier. So we'll...
keep do? going. I'll call to order uh, pilot policy, policy bylaw review committee. That's all right, Your Worship. Um, and approval of the agenda. It's a recommendation for access to information and protection of personal information bylaw as well as records retention bylaw. And what I'm going to do is same as we did last time. I'm going to pass it over to Ian and CAO Rob and you guys can walk us through it. Thank you, Councillor Adams, Madam Chair. Uh, yes, we had, uh, I guess, the first reading of these proposed bylaws at our uh, last meeting at the monthly meeting at Council in January. A uh, couple of uh, small housekeeping matters that we want to take care of here tonight, and I'll turn it over to Ian to walk you through those, and we'll go from there. Okay, uh, good evening, Your Worship, members of Council. Just for the record, my name is Ian McCarville, articled clerk with Key Murray Law, and I'm accompanied tonight by my principal, Derek D. Key, QC. Um, so my, my understanding with respect to the access to information bylaws is that there was a minor uh, clerical error made on, on my part, so I, I take responsibility for that in terms of the text of the bylaw that was presented to you. Um, if you... We, we do, I understand as well that there are copies, printed copies available in the room if anybody uh, wanted to take a look at those at this time. Um, so there was uh, noticed uh, an issue under the definition section, rule 2.1, uh, specifically under paragraph D, under coordinator. Uh, it had read, means access to information protection of privacy coordinator appointed by the council of the city pursuant to this bylaw. But actually in the body of the bylaw, we have the, the, the CAO is being delegated with that authority to appoint the uh, access to information coordinator. So in terms of what would change between first and second reading, just for the purpose of consistency, uh, would simply be to remove the words council of the city under that definition and to replace it with chief administrative officer. Uh, so that was the thing that had been brought to my attention uh, before tonight's meeting and, and I understood that there might as well be further questions or comments about potentially uh, whether or not there would be any amendments to the bylaw between first and second reading, which I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, Just in regards to that, can, is it added to it that the CEO or his designate? Or because our CEO will be on holidays a couple of times a year, or how, so, <coughs> but that's an automatic built in thing, I guess, anyway. I th uh, my understanding. I don't think it's necessary that it be built into the bylaw, but yes. normally if, uh, if I'm planning to be out of the office for a certain period of time, they'll certainly designate certain persons to act in my absence, whether it's for this or... So it doesn't have to be required in the word. Right, and, and so under the regulations, Your Worship, it, it, it says the council will designate a coordinator, and in terms of preparing the first draft of the bylaw, uh, the decision had been made that the council would essentially delegate that authority to the CAO through the text of the bylaw, mm -hmm. and that it would be up to the CAO to, to carry that out. That was the only thing that had been brought to my attention after first reading in terms of issues with the bylaw. If anyone had uh, anything else, any other questions about, about anything in the bylaw or the desire to make changes between first and second reading, that now would be an appropriate time. I'm just wondering, Ian, on the very bottom of each page, it says the effective date is the 17th of February. Is that to coordinate with our monthly council meeting, which is the 18th? Does that make any difference or not? So no. that that was my understanding, and that's why I highlighted it in yellow. Was just with, on the understanding that that would change. But yeah, I guess if it's the 18th, it, it, it was designed to, as a placeholder for the monthly meeting. Can I just ask one question, Madam Chair? Sure, go right ahead. I okay. think the first person to receive information or requests uh, is not our in-house lawyer or Mr. McFarland or the CEO. It's goes to receptionists. I'm wondering uh, 
Is that a good policy, or is the request of that coming in? My gut feeling tells me that maybe it should go to uh, Mr. McFarland. Usually what happens, uh, Your Worship, in the few requests we've received so far is that normally the request will probably go to the access to information coordinator, who is uh, the receptionist for our office. And as a, I guess as a first step, she will usually forward that information to both myself and the, the director of legal services, and then we decide how to address the issue from there, or address the request. I understand that, but I'm just wondering why it was in there first. Uh, something like that, uh, uh, my gut feeling tells me you think we come to our, our, our in-house lawyer, but uh, rather than the receptionist. Uh, I'm not sure what other municipalities have. I mean, she, uh, this individual has received a lot of training and uh, access to information. She's very well qualified uh, to be able to handle any requests that come in. But her instruction is when a request does come in that she'll uh, uh, circle back with both myself and the deputy CAO, who's her in-house lawyer as well. That was designated, I guess, a few years ago, was it, that position? Uh, about a year and a half, maybe two years ago. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Council and, and new CEO, that could be something that, and I'm just saying maybe you want to discuss some of that. Sure. Thank you. Okay, did you want to move on to the next one? It's uh, recommendation CS30 records retention bylaw. Um, yeah, so it. In the uh, interim since the last uh, council meeting, it's my understanding that no issues have arisen uh, with respect to the records retention bylaw. At least none have come, uh, been communicated to me. Yeah, so that was under the access to information bylaw, and, and, and actually, thank you for that question, Your Worship, because I, I realized that I might have misspoken, actually, at, at the last meeting under the appeal. So the, the appeal uh, process that is provided for under the access to information, um, I, I keep calling it access to information, but it's actually a broader bylaw. It's access to information and protection of privacy. So those are kind of two component parts of the bylaw. The uh, appeal process under the bylaw that's provided for in the regulations relates to the protection of privacy piece. So as an example, if a person believed that their personal information had been disclosed improperly, then they could make a request to council to review that decision. And, and under the regulations, council would be required to appoint an adjudicator. Now, under the access to information piece, when someone requests a record of the municipality, for example, and let's say the municipality said, um, you do not have a right of access to that record, uh, the person would still have an opportunity to appeal, but that appeal will be done under the Freedom of Information Act itself, and, and that, that uh, appeal will be done to the privacy commissioner as opposed to locally. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Okay. Thanks very much. Rob, did you have anything further, Russ? Did you have anything further for that? You're good? Yeah. You're good? Okay, okay. I guess we've gotten to the end of the agenda then. Um, transit is on. Transit is on here next. We have one more oh, item. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> here comes the pitch. <laughs> um, Mr. CEO, the floor is yours. Actually, this was a, a question that was raised uh, by both uh, Councillor Adams and Councillor Snow about public transit in general uh, within the city. And there was some question, discussion about where we are with our transit service. Uh, are we looking at ways to improve it? Uh, that sort of thing. And just for uh, the information of all members of council, uh, under the previous council, uh, a committee had been struck consisting of representatives from both council uh, the transit provider, T3, city staff, and also Sullivan Park Corporation. And 
we were looking at ways uh, to, uh, I guess, not only enhance uh, the service, but look at uh, enhancing its visibility across the city in terms of the bus stops, or sorry, the transit stops. Looking at ways in which uh, the scheduling could be modified or improved, and also improve our routing uh, through uh, Slumman Park as well. Um, that work sort of uh, went by the wayside a little bit uh, in the transition from the former council to this council. So I guess the purpose of having it on the agenda for tonight is to ask council if you wish for that uh, committee to restart its work again and uh, we'll get reconstituted and start bringing regular updates back to uh, council. been brought up too much so um, is there well, anything anybody so, to so I, uh, I I sort of reached out uh, to Rob based on the reports coming out of Charlottetown Stratford Cornwall uh, their increased ridership uh, how they're expanding new buses etc uh, and uh, often if you don't uh, do stuff like this you sort of get left behind so that that was where I was wondering uh, where we stood with their current transit system and uh, we are, we're also talking taxi bylaw and, and obviously getting around our city and it, it is important for all our residents so so that's where this came from and then when asking questions to the CAO he informed me that there was previously that uh, committee that was struck so um, personally I'm in favor of uh, us looking at getting that committee going again and ways to improve it and, and uh, maybe even tie in our, our neighboring communities of Kensington and Miskush and, and so on and so forth. Uh, but I, I think there's definitely work that needs to be done to improve our transit because currently I, I personally believe our transit lacks in a number of areas, i.e. shelters and so on, uh, identified route stops, et cetera. So uh, it, it's something that if we're gonna do it, I think if you're gonna have something, you should have it well, well thought out and good service as opposed to just saying it's there as a service. So uh, I would be in favor of getting the committee uh, up and running again for sure. And uh, if, uh, if council is in favor of uh, reactivating that committee, uh, I know uh, Councilor Duran had, had some uh, uh, earlier discussions with the former CAO around transit in general. And uh, I guess my question would be to council uh, would you want uh, Councilor Duran to be the council representative on that committee, or would you like more representation uh, from council on the committee? Just asking the question. I'm like Councilor Snow. I, I would certainly support the continuation of the community, the, re or the, the, the reactivating of the community, right. and Councilor Duran would be an exceptional representative. Congratulations. Congratulations. Well, <laughs> it's happening while it's our Oh, sorry, this is a public meeting. No. <laughs> Unanimous. No. Okay. You should call Mayor. Um, no, I, I'm absolutely happy to carry on with what we've somewhat started, um, myself and, and former CAO Bob. Um, <coughs> we did, uh, we had a little a brief sit down on, uh, it was actually back in June with uh, myself, Bob, uh, Sean McCarville from Southern Park, and Mike Cassidy from T3 was actually on the call as well. And, um, uh, Mike was actually tasked to uh, kind of make contact with some provincial government uh, representatives, I guess. Um, and I followed up with uh, Minister McKay as well shortly after that. And it was just, uh, that was in uh, August. Um, and he said, uh, I think the legislature was just finishing up or opening up. And he said he'd get back to me. And, um, so I followed up with him again, actually today, just in advance of this meeting. And it was probably a little too close to deadline. So I expect to hear back from him likely tomorrow or, or, or very soon, just, just to see if there's any progress there. I just didn't want anything to fall behind and get lost between the cracks. So, so that's still there and there's, we're still certainly discussing it and obviously uh, you are too. So I uh, look forward to starting fresh again, but We'll update as we can, or I will, or I look forward to being updated. Yeah. yeah. I think a lot of it will involve just the dusting off some of the work that has been done by the former committee and then going from there. Yeah. Great. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
you. Nothing else, then we'll call for adjournment. Okay, I guess uh, <laughs> the meeting will adjourn. Uh, I believe there's a couple items for the committee to hold, and, and uh, let's take a five-minute stretch before we come back in. But okay.